Hey friends, it's Chad Gonzalez. Hey, do you like our YouTube channel? I mean, you're here, you're watching this. My question to you is this, have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? If not, hey, click that button, like and subscribe, hit that bell, hit the notification button so that you don't miss out on any of the new content that's here. We want you to be not just a viewer, we want you to be a subscriber. So again, hit like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of the brand new content right here on the Chad Gonzalez Ministries YouTube channel. God bless you. Remember in Christ, we always win. Hey friends, welcome to this session of Healing Talks. I'm Chad Gonzalez. I'm so excited to be with you and uh, just so humble that you would take some time to spend some time with me as we talk about faith and healing, our identity of Christ. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the compassion of the Lord and I'm going to give you some stories that's happened uh, to me over the last few weeks uh, just to just to inspire you in some things, get you thinking along some things. But before we get into there, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so very much to our partners. We love you guys. We've got the best partners on the planet. And we, we got to meet so many of you last week in, in Eckley, Colorado. Uh, man, there were several of you that drove from quite a, quite a, uh, quite a, quite a distance. Uh, we had people from Nebraska, Iowa, um, all over Colorado. Uh, there, were, there was another state or two that I'm, I'm not thinking of, but uh, yeah, we met several partners that drove from two to five hours away. So, uh, you know, I say it all the time, but it truly does humble me so very much. Not only that, that you trust us with your time and your finances and, and uh, the teaching and stuff, but also that you would, you would come to the meetings. And I absolutely love it because we get, to meet, we get to meet you and shake your hand and give you a hug and say thank you. Um, we just couldn't do it without you, and uh, you know, several years ago, I, I just, I never, would have, I never would have thought we'd be at this point, this quickly. But um, God's just been so good, and and you guys that that have that have trusted us, uh, partnered with us, uh, you guys are amazing, and uh, just just so thankful to have you a uh, part of the team. So, thank you guys. Um, hey, speaking of partners, if you haven't sent us your partner picture, please do that. We want to see your picture on our partner wall. You can very simply just grab your phone, take a selfie, and then put it in an email, send it to info at chadgonzalez.com, and in the subject line, put partner picture. Um, also, I want to make mention of the partner platform. If you haven't accessed it, get in there. It's just for our partners. All kinds of great content. We've got a brand new ebook available called The Last Adam. That's in there. Also, Possession of Life. Uh, it's been a while. We've been updating it, and it's been our, sec our, our second top seller, and it's all updated and got a little bit new content in there, new cover that's available on Amazon. There's lots of good stuff going on. Uh, lastly, uh, before we get to the message, let me make mention of this. This week, we've got two, two different meetings. Wednesday night, we're going to be in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, um, and then uh, Saturday, we're going to be in... Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada. So all of our Canadians, it's going to be our first trip up to Canada this year. We can't wait to see all of you. And uh, if you'd like more information on these meetings, you can very simply go to chadgonzalez.com backslash schedule, and you'll be able to get all the information there of times, locations, and all the needed information. All right. So if you have your Bible, let's get into it. If you have your Bible, let's look at Matthew chapter 14. And I mentioned this portion um, a while back. This is something that really, really grabbed my attention uh, last year. Uh, Matthew chapter 14. This is when Herod decides to kill John the Baptist. Cuts John the Baptist's head off. It's basically because he was kind of tricked into this. But remember, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. And in uh, Matthew chapter 14 and verse um, seven says, uh, King Herod, he promised with an oath to give her, talking about his daughter, whatever she would ask. So she, being prompted by her mother, said, give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. The king was sorry, nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John to be beheaded in prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. She brought it to her mother. And then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. And when Jesus heard it, verse 13, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Now look, 
here's Jesus. He just found out about his cousin. And this is a great tragedy. John the Baptist, Jesus said this was the greatest prophet that had ever been on the planet. And this is his cousin. And he just finds out not only has he not only has he been killed, but he had his head chopped off. This is this is some pretty horrific, tragic news. And you see that it does affect Jesus emotionally. I mean, don't don't think that Jesus was just going through life with no emotions. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter two that he came and he partook of flesh and blood, just like us, you know, friends. He came down and did life like us. He had a soul like us, emotions, feelings, hurts. He's doing life in a body like us. He's doing life like us. And he finds out this information and you see it, it does affect him to the point where he pulls away to get away from everybody, to get by himself. You know, when you get some bad news, you just, you just a lot of times you just want to be by yourself um, just to, to deal with things. And it says that when he departed to this deserted place by himself, the multitudes heard about it and they followed him on foot from the cities. So here's Jesus and he's pulled away to deal with this. And it says that when the multitude saw him, they came or knew where he was at. They went out and verse 14 says, Jesus went out. And when he went out, he saw this great multitude of people. And he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. So here's Jesus. He, he's lost a loved one. There's, there's, some, there's some hurt, sorrow there. But he didn't allow it to make him go hide off in a cave and stay there. He didn't take time away from ministry to deal with his emotions and hurts. He understood where John the Baptist was at. Jesus knew what he was about to do. John the Baptist is in paradise, and because of what Jesus was going to do, John the Baptist ultimately was going to be in heaven, just like Jesus' father. And he didn't allow the hurt to keep in a place of selfishness toward him. And it says he saw the multitudes, a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them. And he healed their sick, you know, this is where some people, when they, when they heard about my situation, you know, my, my late wife, Lacey, uh, you know, a little over a year or a year and a half ago, I guess, you know, when she moved to heaven, I had a lot of people tell me, you just need to take some time off from ministry. You just need to focus on yourself, focus on your emotions. And I did that for, for three weeks and that was enough for me. Because, you know, the, the more you get focused on yourself, the more you, you begin to feel sorry for yourself, the more you begin to wallow in pity, uh, the more that your thoughts just sit there and just want to run wild with things. You know, I don't want to be focused on me. I, I remember those, those first two weeks, um, I had meetings planned. And the late the week that Lacey went to heaven, that following week I was supposed to be in Jamaica. We were actually all going to go uh, together, me, Lacey, and Jake. And then that following weekend, I had some meetings in another place, and and um, and I canceled those first two weeks of meetings just because we had things we had to take care of and and deal with. And I was trying to figure out how am I going to move forward with this, but. Uh, I kept the last meeting for that month and I did that because I remember telling Jake, I was like, Hey buddy, like I can't, I can't do this. I can't just sit here. I've got to go out and do the thing that makes me alive. I can't sit around here and just focus on me. I've got a mission. We've got a job to do. And it's about people. And it's amazing what happens when you take the focus off of you and you put it on other people. I had some people that looked at me and thought I just wasn't caring or hard hearted or whatever. People didn't understand. Uh, I was just, I was trying to get through the situation and people handle things differently. But for me, I, I couldn't just sit there and focus on me. 
where I felt alive was fulfilling the mission that God had for me. And a part of that mission was people. It was amazing when I began to, to refocus again and get focused on people. All of a sudden, there's a great motivation there. Of course, uh, I also had some tremendous motivation because not only had I been going after what I was doing out of obedience to Jesus and, and then also, you know, for people now, I was doing it out, out of vengeance, you know, for Lacey. And uh, just began to focus on people. And it was amazing what happened when you focus on people. When you focus on people, there's just such a tremendous grace that just begins to flow out of your life. And, and it says right here that Jesus, even in the midst of this tragic situation, he took his eyes off himself and put his eyes on people. And you know what happened? He had compassion for them. And look what that compassion did. That compassion caused him to heal their sick. Compassion will take you out of a place of uh, hurt. Compassion for other people will take you out of, of a, place, a place of grief and sorrow. Compassion will take you out of a place of, of looking at yourself. Compassion will take you out of a place and keep you uh, on the path and the plan of God for your life. The compassion of the Lord for other people. He was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. Uh, I want you to look at this, this other instance right here. Look at uh, Mark. I'm mean, sorry, Matthew. There's one more instance here. Matthew, I want to look at uh, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 29. It says, As they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed Jesus. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out and said, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. They cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, Lord, Son of David. Jesus stood still and said, What do you want me to do for you? Now, this just shows you the boldness and tenacity of Jesus, his understanding of things. Because look at what he said. He's looking at two blind men, obviously. They're going to have their... They're, they're blind beggars' coats, so people know who they are. It's going to be obvious that they're, they're blind, they're beggars. And Jesus stands before them and says, what do you want me to do for you? In other words, what do you need? What do you want? Because I can do this for you. What do you need? Just tell me, what do you need? And they said, Lord, that our eyes would be opened. And it says, Jesus had compassion. And he touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. He had compassion and he just touched them. The touch of compassion. What's the possibility that the touch of compassion could produce a miracle? What's the possibility that many times we're just giving someone a touch? That many of the things that take place in church, we're just, we're just kind of randomly, mechanically just touching people, laying hands on people. But what if there was a touch of compassion, a, a laying on of hands that's coming from a place of compassion, that the love of God would just flow through us to such a tremendous degree that healing flows. Let me show you this, this other one right here. Look, Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. This was with the leper. It says, A leper came to him and implored him, kneeling down to him and said, If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus, again, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and he touched him. Look at it again. A touch of compassion. And he said, I am willing. Be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. This is something that, that I've, this is part of my prayer as of late when it comes to ministry. Is this, Father, help me to have your compassion for people. 
Give me your compassion for people. Your compassion for the sick. Now look, you know, I know I'm not the healer. I'm not stupid. I know I'm not the healer. I can't do anything in and of myself, by myself. It's just like Jesus said, I, I can do nothing of myself. It's the Father in me that does the works. I know it's the Christ in me that does the works, but he moves and works through us. I, I remember uh, I was talking with a friend of mine a, a while back just about the compassion of the Lord. It, I, I really believe it's something that's missing uh, from, from us as ministers. Compassion. A true compassion for people that uh, I, I feel for you. I feel your pain. I feel your hurts. And it just moves me. You know, when you're in this position, you ought to see the emails that we get, messages that we get. I mean, it's heartbreaking. Messages from people about their child, their spouse, a loved one been given a death sentence, chronic condition, been dealing with it, you know, for 10, 20 years. And people are just desperate for help, desperate for answers. You know, I take this really, really, really serious When we we have these meetings each weekend, I, I don't I don't look at it as just another meeting. I'm certainly not going to it just to get an offering. I think sometimes people forget what it actually takes to get to these meetings. So many times, I mean, it's sometimes it's a lot of travel, lots and lots of hours, some time by yourself, in airports by yourself, hotel by yourself, driving by yourself. I mean, this past weekend, you know, that was. It was about five hours of flight time and then about a two and a half hour drive just to get to the, the meetings and stuff. I don't do this for me. Um, certainly not doing it for money, not doing it for fame. I'm doing it for, for people. Uh, I look at each each meeting as a, as a mission because I, I know that there's people that's going to be there. They have no hope. Doctors have given them no hope. And so... They're, they're looking to me. They're looking to you. And so this is why I, I take every day seriously as far as study and, and prayer because I know there's people that are looking to us. And again, I'm not the healer. You're not the healer. But we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. We are the body of Christ. And if people are going to experience Jesus, it's going to come through us. And it, it really touches me. I mean... I may not be able to respond. I may not be able to personally respond to every single email, but all of those that come in, I see them. And praying and just asking God, you know, to give you revelation, give me revelation, give us insight into these things. But that's something that's really been on my heart. Father, give me your compassion. And, you know, I, I do. I take it very, very personally. When we minister to people, I, I take it extremely personally when we don't see a result that we know that we should. Um, I, I'm not a very emotional person, but I mean, I'll be honest with you. There's, there's been lots of times behind closed doors, by myself in a car, in a closet, just cry because, uh, I know, I know what the standard is. The standard is Jesus. I know where it should be. And so I, I take it very personally if we don't see the result because I'm looking to myself. And, and this is where I'm just, you know, I cry out like, God, give me the answer. Show me. Show me what needs to be done. Show me what needs to be said. I, I don't want to ever be in a place where we're just going in and we just, we're just randomly laying hands on people and, getting all excited. So I, I, don't, I don't care about that. I'm all for being excited and us shouting and running and hollering, but ultimately I want results. Uh, I want people to live and not die. I want people to be healed and whole and not be in pain, not, not suffering. 
I want people to be able to go back to the doctor and say, look at what God did in my life. I want the doctor to be standing there in amazement, have to make a choice. Either I believe God or I don't, but I can't deny that this isn't a miracle. You see several instances with Jesus, move with compassion, move with compassion, move with compassion. And what really got me kind of rethinking this here lately was um, just a few weeks ago, we were doing a meeting and and there was this one particular lady, you could tell she'd been hurting, suffering pretty bad. She had some particular issues going on. and We laid hands on her, ministered to her. I told her to go do some things. A few minutes later, I, I walked back over to check on her. She goes to sit up and she's in extreme pain. And she started tearing up and it, it just, it, it got me. And I said, ma'am, give me a hug. And so she reached out. I reached out and just gave her a hug. Just loved on her. And all of a sudden I had a, had a word of knowledge about this woman. The word trauma just came to my mind. You know how you just kind of have this thought. You just kind of see something in your, what we say, our mind's eye, your imagination, your con consciousness, whatever you want to call it. But just this thought, this knowing trauma, trauma. And I sat there. I, I should know better by now, but, but I did. I, I sat there. I was hugging her and just thinking about the trauma, trauma. And so I went ahead and said, I said, ma'am, trauma. There's trauma that's caused this situation. And then more started coming to me. I said, wait, but this is, this is, this isn't just physical. This is emotional trauma. And then more started coming and I realized this, this wasn't a new thing. This is old. And, and in a flash, I knew she had been molested as a kid. Now this woman was older. Um, I'm, a, I'm assuming probably sixties. And now, you know, something like that. I, I don't, I don't like to say stuff like that out loud. Um, make that's private stuff. You know, I could say that out loud and someone and the person go, yeah. And then people go, people around go, Ooh, wow. Uh, I don't care about that. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about protecting people. And so I kept that part to myself, but I just told her, I said, ma'am, what happened to you is not your fault. You are not deserving of it, but you need to let it go. The hurts it's caused, you need to let it go. So I hugged her, walked off, and I walked up, and I sat down beside April, and I looked at her, I said, I bet you $100 she was molested as a kid. And anyway, pastor closes up the service. People come up, we're talking, everything. She comes up, we're talking, and I said, hey, I've got to ask you. I could be wrong, but I've got to ask you, were you molested as a kid? She said, yeah. Well, I mean, that... Not that that information, we don't get excited about that information, but the fact that it was confirmed to me that, yeah, you, you did hear from God very specifically in that. that. That part's exciting to me. I hurt for her that she went through that tragic uh, experience as a kid. But it's always a good thing for me, you know, to have confirmation that you're hearing from God. But I mean, like, it was... It was just a sudden compassion in me that I just felt for her and it just moved me and said, give me a hug. I didn't have a word for it that part. Just give me a hug and just, just hug her and just love on her. And from, from that touch of compassion, uh, word, words of knowledge came forth, very specific things. I'd never met that woman before, didn't know nothing about her. So, how would I know that? Well, the Holy Spirit obviously showed me that. I had another interesting situation happen. Um, I was at a church recently and going around through the, the, the auditorium, laying hands on different people. I, we'd kind of run out of time, and so I'm having to go fairly quickly. 
laying hands on different people. And I saw this one couple, a husband and wife, and they had their, their hands holding each other's hands, holding up together. And it just, it caught my attention. Now, I didn't know, because I had told people, if, if you got something going on in your body, raise your hand. And I'm going to come by and lay hands on you. So they both had their hands together, holding up. So I didn't know. I mean, at first glance, I didn't know, okay, is it the man or the woman? Or is it both? But immediately, I saw, when I saw them, immediately there was just something on the inside of me that drew me to them. And I didn't know who they were. And I knew it was with the woman. And I knew it was cancer. And I walked up to them. Now, and this is just a, this is just a side note of information. If you're ever in this position, it's one thing if you're dealing with people in private. It's another thing if you're dealing with people in public. And again, I'm concerned about people. I could care less about people being wowed because they see you have a word of knowledge and it's, it's right, it's spot on. I'm not concerned about that. I'm not concerned about the, the praise or the criticism of people, especially the criticism. But, uh, but I walked up to him, I grabbed her hand and just began to encourage them that the doctor's report needs to be changed. We shouldn't be afraid of cancer. Cancer has, has nothing on us. Cancer's afraid of us. Just kind of encouraging along those lines so that just in case I was wrong, you know, I, I don't know, because see, I don't know if I'm going to get to talk to these people afterwards. So I don't want to say something, be wrong, but it could put a fear in their life. They didn't have cancer, but then they start to think, oh, the, the man of God said this. I, I, I wonder if I have it. I don't want that to take place. So I just kept, kept it kind of general, but at the same time to encourage them, laid hands on, pray with them. Well, at the end of the service, they come out, um, standing out the, at the our product table and they come out, they came to buy a book. I saw them and started talking to him. I pulled the, the wife off to the side and I said, hey, is it is it cancer that you're dealing with? Now, again, I didn't know if it was her or the husband that needed prayer. But she said, yeah, I've got, you know, and she explained all of it. And then I found out it was the pastor's daughter-in-law. Well, that, that shocked me even more because um, I didn't know who they were. But again, you know, and understand what I'm saying on, on the one side, great for me as far as confirmation that what I was picking up was true. Um, I hate hearing that it is true for them. Yet at the same time, the compassion of the Lord for people lead to the gifts of the spirit being operation, the power of God in operation. And yet then I told her, I said, hey, if God would reveal that to me, do you think he just reveal it and then not do anything about it? Oh, if he's revealing it, it's because there's something taking place in your body right now. God's going to reveal it so he can do something about it. He's going to reveal it to inspire you, inspire your faith to grab a hold of this thing and produce a miracle in your life. I, I want to encourage you. Don't just, let's, let's, let's don't be mechanical in what we do. Let's, let's still have a heart. I mean, I, I, I know it sounds kind of odd that we would be doing ministry and it's for people. But friends, I'm telling you, it's very, very easy to get over into a place of doing ministry, but you're tired. You're exhausted. I mean, I've been, I've been at that, honestly, I've been at that place the last month. We've just been go, 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 go. And it's been a lot, not just weekends. I mean, things going on during the week. I mean, even last week. Last week was a monster. Like we were, I was in Huntsville, Alabama on Friday night and then Pensacola, you know, all day Saturday and then Sunday morning and Sunday night and then uh, drive home and then uh, on Monday and then I'm um, where, then I was in Charlotte on Tuesday and then we filmed eight episodes on Wednesday and eight episodes on Thursday. And then I turned around on Saturday, you know, went to Colorado and then you know, did services on Sunday and then flew all the way back home. And like, it's been like that for, for several weeks. And if you're not careful, you can get to that place if you just start going through the motions. And it's about people, but you start going through the motions. You go to lay hands on people and you're just kind of going through the motions. 
you know, you have a prayer line and, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not personally big on doing the prayer line. Sometimes you have to just because of the size of the crowd, but even in those prayer lines, we need to, we need to, as the minister, we need to be careful that we don't, don't just get to a place where we're not even paying attention to the people that we're just going through and just laying hands on people. And I get it. There's time constraints. I get it. I'm, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying as far as our heart, our motivation, the compassion of the Lord's got to be there. I mean, look at it. It says with Jesus, we read great multitudes. He saw great multitudes. And he was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. Multitudes. You're talking about potentially thousands of people. So there's probably more than 10 or 20, 50 sick people there. So this might mean you might have to take a little time. And I get it. I, I, again, I, I get with their services, there's time constraints and stuff. But, you know, some of our, okay, a lot of our services, they go a little long. And there's a reason because we spend time with people. And there's also a reason that we see great results. It's because we're spending time with people. We, 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 we can't. We can't out, we can't get away from the compassion of, of the Lord that's got to be a part of us and what we're doing and allowing that to move through us for other people. That, that, that needs to be a part of your, your, your daily prayer. God, let your compassion be in me for other people. I mean, there's the human compassion where we feel sorry for someone. But I want, I want the compassion of God to flow in me and flow through me so that we can see people set free and delivered and, and healed and, and restored. And, and for those that don't know Jesus, to see their hearts open wide to receive of him. Let me tell you this, this one other story and then we'll go. And this was my first glimpse into this. And this is back in the very beginning. Uh, we had started our first church in College Station, Texas. This was in September of 2006 and uh, just going back and thinking about those days just uh, so much fun amazing just the, the rawness just not knowing anything but being so hungry and just raw and going after the things of God and I remember it was uh, the first weekend there in October and there was this little grandmother she had brought her son her grandson he's four years old he had Hodgkin's disease he had cancer and he had three tumors on top of his head and I remember she brought him up at the end of service, asked me to pray for him. And so he brought, they brought him up. I'm 28 years old, or yeah, 28 years old. And I'm holding him in my left hand. And I put my hand on his head, my right hand on his head. And he had three tumors on his head. I could feel them under my head. And I, I began to pray. And it didn't see anything necessarily happen. And so I said, everyone, let's just lift our hands and let's just begin to thank God for what he's doing in his life. And, and we lifted our hands and we just began to praise God. I'm holding him in my arms. And then all of a sudden, just on the inside, I just broke. Now, I mean, I, I don't like to cry in front of people like most people don't like to cry in front of other people. And I'm kind of a man's man. I don't want to cry in front of people. But I just broke on the inside because this thought just that, I mean, he's four years old. He hasn't done anything wrong. I mean, not that you deserve sickness or disease or healing or you know, whatever, but I mean, I'm just thinking, the boy's never done anything wrong. It's not right. It's not right that this little boy at four years old should die. It's not right. And I just began to hurt on the inside, and I just lost it. And I just began to hold him. I remember just crying like a baby holding, holding this boy, just hurt, hurt. I didn't, I didn't think about it at the time, but just it was the compassion of God just flowing through me for this little boy. And man, I just cried. And and I had I put my hand on top back on top of his head. I remember holding him like this. And I'm just crying, just just hurting, just crying. All of a sudden, it was like somebody put a pin in a balloon. I felt that large tumor just began to shrink down. It began just to sh just get smaller and smaller and smaller. It got down about the size of a small little pea. And I got so excited, I stopped, I looked at the grandmother, and said, Grandma, you gotta come see this. She comes up and, and the boy, he had kind of short hair and she starts feeling and looking. She says, oh my goodness, the, the two smaller tumors, they're gone. 
and the largest one's the size of a pea. I said, yeah. We began to shout and praise God. And, you know, they took that boy back to the doctor. He had a checkup. It was uh, later on that week or the following week. The tumors are completely gone. They run all the scans, and the scans came back, and he was completely cancer-free. And it hit me when I, when I found out about that. It hit me. I was like, that was the compassion of God. That was the compassion of God that moved through me with that little boy. And so, friend, I just want to encourage you. Uh, we're going to take communion here, uh, but I just want to encourage you. Let this be on your mind. Let compassion be in your heart. And, you know, there's, there's so much turmoil, so much division, so much just, just demonic evil mess that's going on in our world and society. And this is an election season here in America. And, and so it's just nasty division in politics. And I understand there, there's definitely light and darkness. There, there's evil and, and, and there's good. But don't get caught up in all of that. Certainly, we need to do our part. We pray, we vote. But when we see people, let's see them for, for the situation that it is. It's people that are lost, they're hurting, they're dying, they have no hope. And some of them just flat out filled with the devil himself. Let's let allow the compassion of the Lord just to rise up within us and let that be a part of our daily prayer. Father, let your compassion flow through me. Actually, put that in the chat right now, if you would. Write that in the chat. Say, Father, let your compassion flow through me. Father, let your compassion flow through me. Let your compassion flow through me. And then put this in the chat as well. Let my hands produce touches of compassion. Let my hands produce touches of compassion. Let my hands produce touches of compassion so that your compassion flows through me and produces healing and health and freedom in someone else's life. Praise God. Let's go ahead and take communion. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he gives us this command in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you can, I've got my, my, my bread here and juice. You can get you a cracker, water, milk, chip, whatever you've got. First Corinthians chapter 11. And he says this right here. He says, I received it from the Lord that which I received. When I delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup in the new covenant is my blood. This do as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I mean, you want to talk about compassion for people. Compassion for people, you give your life, pour out your blood, your body be beaten and bruised and stabbed. That's what Jesus did for us. And when it comes to healing and health, hey, we need to discern the Lord's body. We need to discern what he has done for us and how he is right now at the right hand of God. And that is the way that we are right here and right now. Father, we just thank you for the sacrifice that you made in giving your son. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, for loving us and, and being moved with compassion for us, for our, for our forgiveness our deliverance, our safety, protection, freedom, our health, setting us free from all sin, all sickness, all disease, all addiction, arthritis, cancer, dementia, scoliosis, diabetes, heart disease. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us free that we would no longer be a slave to these things. We love you and thank you for all that you've done for us and all you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you've brought us through and all that you're bringing us into. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Go ahead and break and eat. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, friend, thank you so very much for spending some time with us as we talk, just talk about the compassion of the Lord. Hey, let's determine to be tools and vessels of compassion 
Actually, put that in the chat. That's that's actually good right there. Put that in the chat. I determined to be a vessel of God's compassion. I determined to be a vessel of God's compassion. That's what we're going to do. Praise the Lord. Hey, friends, we love you so very much. Thank you for joining in and watching Healing Talks with us. Hey, if you would, especially if you're watching there on YouTube, if you would, please like and subscribe there so you don't miss out on any content. Uh, we want to see 50,000 subscribers on there. and We're very well on our way. We love you so very much. We hope to see you in Charlotte or in Canada this weekend. If you can't be there, make sure and go check out our schedule on the website, chadgonzalez.com. You can see all of our upcoming meetings. Uh, next month, we're going to be in Tulsa two times. We're going to be in Oregon and uh, we're going to be in Birmingham, Alabama as well. So God bless you. We love you so very much. Thank you for all of you that are partners with us. Thank you for being a part of the team. Hey, remember in Christ, we always win. We'll see you next Tuesday for another session of Ethan Talks. Bye-bye.